And in this video, we'll talk about chapter 20, which is the endocrine system. Um, over the course of this particular chapter and lecture videos, we'll talk about endocrine glands and their respective hormones. We'll talk about how the hypothalamus controls most of your endocrine system. Uh, we'll talk about how the pituitary gland has a certain structure and function as well as the various hormones that are released by it. Uh, we'll talk about the structure and function of the, of the thyroid gland, parathyroid glands, the adrenal glands, your pancreas, pineal, thymus, as well as some other accessory endocrine structures like your kidneys, your heart, your GI tract, and your gonads. So uh, endocrine glands, like we talked about uh, in AMP1, are uh, basically ductless glands. So these endocrine glands release their hormones into the extracellular fluid without the use of ducts, and then those hormones then can diffuse into either your lymphatic system or into your bloodstream to where then they travel to their target tissues and exert some sort of effect. So it's, it's your circulatory system like your bloodstream and lymphatic system that really helps conduct or carry endocrine signals, which are hormones, throughout your body. Now, uh, what this means is that your endocrine glands and organs have extensive distribution of blood vessels. So because they need to release those signaling molecules into the bloodstream, there's a lot of blood vessels in these glands to help carry those hormones away to other organs and tissues throughout your body. Now it turns out that your endocrine system and your nervous system kind of function similarly. If you remember, if you remember from AMP1, we talked about how the nervous system acts to kind of control and direct the processes of all other organ systems. Now the endocrine system does that as well, but through a variety of different mechanisms. Okay. Now <clears throat> uh, what we see here then on the left is the nervous system form of communication and on the right is the endocrine form of communication. If you guys remember with the nervous system we had neurons which are the nerve cells that help carry action potentials long distance and very rapidly. Now these action potentials were propagated down the axon where they synapse on target cells which have a particular receptor. Okay, That was the nervous form of communication where it's very rapid However, we have short-term effects. So the effects of the nervous system are more short-term. Now this differs from the endocrine system because our uh, cells here that release hormones release them into the bloodstream where they diffuse into the bloodstream. Now they diffuse kind of slowly. Once they get into the bloodstream, these hormones can only go as fast as blood goes. And you can imagine that blood doesn't flow as fast as action potentials travel. Like we talked about how some action potentials can travel up to 360 feet per second. There's no way your blood travels that fast. So that means that hormonal communication is much more slow. So it takes longer for hormones to reach their target tissue or organ. And what also differs here too is that these hormones go everywhere where blood goes. They're not going to just travel to their target tissue. These hormones are going to go throughout the body and diffuse throughout your body's tissues. And then eventually, just due to random chance, some of those hormones will make it to their target tissue by leaving the bloodstream and diffusing in the tissue and then binding to receptors on the target cell. But all of that takes time. It takes time for those hormones to be secreted by the endocrine cells. It takes time for those hormones to diffuse into the bloodstream. It takes time for those hormones to travel throughout the bloodstream and it takes time for those hormones to eventually meet their target tissue. So what this means is the endocrine system is much slower than the nervous system. But what's also interesting too is that the endocrine system has more long-lasting effects. So if you think about the effect of a particular hormone, once it binds to its receptor, that hormone has much more long-lasting effects on that target tissue than the nervous system. The nervous system will have shorter effects. Like when we talk about muscle twitches, like those are very fast series of, of responses to the neurons activating that muscle. Now, if you think about hormones that activate a tissue, those hormones will exert a much more long-term type of effect on that tissue. Now, what this table shows is just a kind of a, uh, a compare and contrast of the nervous and endocrine systems. We know that the communication methods differ because neurons use action potentials whereas your endocrine system uses hormones. 
we know that the target of stimulation differs too because neurons directly connect to their target tissue, whereas the endocrine system is not directly connected to its target tissue. Um, what happens then is the hormones have to travel throughout your bloodstream before eventually getting to their target tissue. We also find that the response time is different, so that in the nervous system, the response time is very rapid. So that the effect on that tissue uh, by the nervous system is much more rapid than the effect of the tissue by the endocrine system. Now, um, uh, the range of effect is also different too, guys. So with the, with the nervous system, uh, it has much more of a localized effect because the neurons can only influence the cells that they directly connect to. And this differs from the endocrine system because those hormones can diffuse throughout the body and have a much more wide range of effect on basically anywhere where blood goes, that hormone can go. Whereas in the nervous system, those neurons can only activate cells in the tissues that they uh, connect to directly. Now, um, we also know there's a difference in the duration of responses. So the, endoc the endocrine system is more of a long-term response. The nervous system is more of a short-term response. Okay? Now, this is just to kind of summarize what we talked about with the nervous system. Uh, and today's lecture is all about the endocrine system. Now, they're similar in the sense that they both are involved in controlling organ systems throughout your body. And it turns out that we talk about these kind of being related because the endocrine system is really controlled by your nervous system. When we talk about how uh, different hormones are released, that's ultimately influenced by the hypothalamus in your brain, which really directs the activities of your endocrine system. Now, what this next slide here is showing is just a general overview of the endocrine system. And we have some major endocrine glands, as well as some of, of it, these are called accessory endocrine glands. Now, the major endocrine glands are the ones who are really just mostly devoted to the endocrine system. So some examples of like major endocrine glands would be things like your pituitary gland, which has anterior and posterior lobes. This also includes your pineal gland, which releases something like melatonin. Uh, it also includes things like your thyroid gland, which is the largest endocrine gland in your body because the thyroid gland is solely devoted to producing hormones, nothing else. Um, now, the parathyroid glands you find on the back of the thyroid gland over here, and there are, there are also some major endocrine glands, as well as your adrenal glands, which sit <clears throat> atop the kidneys, and those are involved in releasing a, a series of hormones from the cortex and the medulla of that structure. Now, these are the major endocrine glands because they have really just a, a sole endocrine function or purpose. That differs from the minor or accessory endocrine glands because what happens is that most organs in your body release some sort of hormone. Some, so some accessory endocrine glands could be something like your thymus, your heart, your skin, your kidneys, your digestive tract. All of those release hormones, but because those organs and tissues have other functions, we call those accessory or minor endocrine glands or organs because they have other functions as well. They just happen to also release hormones. Like you may not have known that the heart actually releases hormones. And it's involved in blood pressure regulation, which we'll talk about later. Same with the kidney itself. You know, your, your kidneys are these filtration organs, but these also release their own hormones that, that regulate blood pressure. So uh, we'll talk about the structure and functions of all of these major and accessory or minor endocrine glands in the coming uh, slides. Now remember, all endocrine glands release hormones, and hormones are the principal uh, communication method or molecule of the endocrine system. Now what happens is that a hormone, uh, once it's released by its endocrine cell or gland, those are going to travel either through the lymph or your bloodstream until they eventually get to their target cell or target organ. Now what determines whether an organ or tissue is a target for that hormone is whether or not that organ or tissue has a receptor for that hormone. If the organ or tissue has the appropriate receptor for that hormone, then that hormone can exert an effect on that organ or tissue. This is an important note because not all organs and tissues have all of the possible receptors for all of your hormones in your body. That's not the case. It turns out that only some cells in your body express receptors for some hormones. So what that means is you might find hormones in an organ or tissue that's not a target tissue. Because those hormones can leave your bloodstream and enter that tissue, 
if there's no receptor present for that hormone, the hormone will not exert an effect. So I'll give you guys, give you guys an example. Um, something like follicle stimulating hormone, which influences the gonads, if you find that hormone in the kidneys, it's not going to exert an effect on the kidneys because there's no receptor for that hormone in the kidneys, even though you're finding the hormone there. So really what determines whether a hormone has an effect on a tissue is if there's a receptor present and that hormone then can bind the receptor, activate that receptor, and then exert an effect on that organ or tissue. And this is kind of an interesting point because you can find these hormones in places where they really don't need to be. Like for instance, you can find a lot of hormones in your saliva, even though they have no role or purpose in your saliva. You know, you can actually determine someone's cortisol levels uh, by taking a sputum sample in their, um, from their spit and doing uh, analysis on that spit to figure out the concentration of cortisol in their saliva. But cortisol, that hormone, has no effect on the organs or tissues of your mouth. Uh, it just happens to end up there because hormones really go everywhere where blood goes and they can be incorporated into kind of weird places. But really what determines whether or not a hormone has an effect on a target tissue is we gotta have a receptor for that specific hormone. If there's no receptor present, that hormone will not exert an effect on that tissue. You might wonder, well, how, why is this important? Well, there's lots of different diseases that can affect whether or not tissues have a certain receptor. Like what if that receptor were blocked you know, by um, a particular molecule or your, or your body's own immune system starts attacking receptors for a hormone and those receptors start going away, well then it's like the tissue never had a receptor for that hormone and it won't exert an effect. And so we'll, we'll talk about those sort of disorders um, in pathophysiology. Now there are several different classes of hormones. We have the peptide hormones, the steroid hormones, and the biogenic amines. Um, the peptide hormones are made of protein. So an example of a peptide hormone could be like oxytocin or insulin. Those are peptide or protein hormones. Typically these peptide hormones are kind of smaller proteins that are only several amino acids in length. And what happens is these peptide hormones are water soluble, which means they can dissolve in the watery solutions of your body really well, but they can't cross the plasma membrane very well. So these peptide hormones don't cross the plasma membrane. In fact, they have to bind to receptors on the extracellular surface of the plasma membrane in order to exert an effect on that particular cell. Now this differs from the steroid hormones because steroid hormones are derived from cholesterol. Cholesterol is a variety of lipid and lipids don't mix well in water. So that steroid hormones don't dissolve as well in the watery solutions of your body Typically, these steroid hormones need like a transport protein of some sort. And um, what happens then is that these steroid hormones can cross the plasma membrane where they bind to receptors inside of the cell. And typically, steroid hormones actually influence gene activity in cells. Because these steroid hormones can get inside of a cell, they can bind to a receptor. Now, what's kind of cool is sometimes the steroid hormone receptor complex can actually turn on and turn off genes inside of your cell. That's how these steroid hormones work. And that differs from the peptide hormones because these hormones have to bind to receptors on the cell surface, not inside the cell. So these peptide hormones mostly affect things like enzymes inside the cell. Whereas the steroid hormones mostly affect gene expression. Like they can turn on or turn off certain genes in your body. Um, the biogenic amines are just another class of hormones that we may talk about um, in these videos. Now one important note about um, hormonal communication is that all hormonal communication involves what are called feedback mechanisms. And there's two types of feedback mechanisms in our body. We have negative feedback and positive feedback. Um, now the reason why they're called negative and positive feedback has to do with their effects in this sort of response mechanism. But what negative feedback does is it helps prevent certain processes from getting too uh, amplified or too strong. So negative feedback has a tendency to diminish or make changes in your body less severe, less small, or sorry, uh, more small or less severe. They're going to kind of help dampen down certain responses. This differs from positive feedback, which makes um, certain responses in your body more amplified or more severe. 
And I'll give you guys some examples of positive versus negative feedback on this next slide. So with this slide here, we're, we're looking at an example of uh, negative feedback. So the example here is like eating a cheeseburger or something. Once you eat that cheeseburger, the nutrients in that burger can get absorbed along your digestive tract. And what happens is because there's sugar in the meat in the form of glycogen, there's also sugar in the bun because there's sugar in bread, and bread itself is a carbohydrate. What happens is that your blood sugar levels will temporarily kind of spike. So after eating this cheeseburger, blood sugar levels increase. But we know that blood sugar levels have to be maintained within a certain range. So what that means is that if, you're, if you eat a cheeseburger and your blood sugar levels increase, then we need a response by our body to decrease that blood sugar. So what this example here is showing you guys is this gentleman here is eating a cheeseburger. Um, after he eats that cheeseburger, then his blood sugar levels increase and his pancreas then can sense that where it can release the hormone insulin. Insulin as a hormone, which we'll talk about in a little bit, acts to decrease blood sugar levels by increasing the amount of absorption of sugar by your body cells. So what insulin can do as it's released by your pancreas is basically cause your body cells to take glucose from your bloodstream or sugar from your bloodstream and put it into the cell, thereby reducing or lowering your blood sugar levels. Okay? So it, in, uh, one of the places it can do this then is your, in your liver. So that insulin can actually cause your liver to take glucose or sugar out of your bloodstream and store it in the liver in the form of something called glycogen, which is a type of carbohydrate or basically uh, complex sugar. Now, by taking blood sugar out of the bloodstream, you lower your blood glucose, and that by lowering blood glucose, it kind of gets you back to a normal homeostatic level. So this is an example of negative feedback. So the change was an increase in blood sugar, and the response is a decrease in blood sugar. You might wonder, well, what's the significance of this in our body? Well, it turns out that most endocrine feedback mechanisms are negative feedback because they're going to keep your body within some sort of narrow or homeostatic range. So, for instance, blood sugar has to be maintained within a certain range. You don't want your blood sugar to be too high or too low. So what happens is we have sort of hormonal feedback responses to keep that glucose or blood sugar within a specific narrow range. Okay. Um, another example of this, I believe we talked about in AMP1, is like uh, body temperature regulation. But it has nothing to do with hormones. But with negative feedback, like if, you, if your body temperature increases, the response then is to sweat, which helps cool you down, and that decreases your body temperature. Right? That can bring you back to a homeostatic level. So that would be an example of negative feedback. Um, now, this differs from positive feedback because positive feedback acts to increase change in the body. And if you think about it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense in terms of maintaining homeostasis because you wouldn't want to become hotter if you were already hot. But that would be the response if body temperature regulation followed a positive feedback manner. Like if body temperature regulation was positive feedback, you guys, like increasing body temperature could cause you to shiver which would make you hotter. But it doesn't make sense because that would just make us hotter and take us away from homeostasis. So most of these feedback mechanisms in our body aren't positive feedback. They're going to be um, negative feedback. Now, some examples of positive feedback include things like uh, breast milk letdown. So what happens then, you guys, is that um, when the baby starts suckling on a nipple for milk, uh, the mother can release a hormone called oxytocin and what oxytocin does is it increases milk letdown or milk secretion by the breast to help deliver milk to that baby. You might, wonder, you might wonder, well, how is this positive feedback? Well, if the baby starts suckling on the nipple, you get increases in oxytocin, which cause milk to be secreted, and the baby starts suckling more, then you get, that, that causes more oxytocin to be released, which causes more milk to be released. The baby starts suckling more, causes more oxytocin to be released, causes more milk to be released. And the whole thing just goes cir circular, right? It gets stronger and stronger and stronger. That's why it's positive feedback. Another example of positive feedback in the body, you guys, are also uterine contractions during labor. So um, during labor, uh, what can happen too is that once the uterus starts to contract, that causes oxytocin to be released, 
which also stimulates stronger and stronger uterine contractions and causes more and more oxytocin to be released, causing more and more uterine contractions. It's positive feedback because you're enhancing the change or basically making the change more strong or more amplified. And that differs from negative feedback because negative feedback acts to decrease change. Remember with negative feedback, this is where, um, you know, like example here is like if your blood glucose increases, negative feedback would be a response mechanism that acts to lower or decrease your blood sugar. Okay. Now if this example were like positive feedback, it would be like if you ate a cheeseburger, your blood glucose increased and your body released hormones that cause your blood glucose to further increase. It wouldn't make sense because you don't want your blood glucose to get too high because um, that can actually start to what they call glycosylate protein or basically caramelize protein because sugars can start sticking onto protein in your body. So it's important to keep your blood sugar low, not, not severely high. So just to kind of summarize negative versus positive feedback, you guys. Um, in negative feedback, what happens is that we have a stimulus that causes a particular hormone to be released that slows down a process or turns that process off or can turn another process on that causes another process to slow down. But it's negative feedback because it acts to decrease change in the system. Okay. Now, an example here was blood glucose regulation, which we talked about earlier. Um, Positive feedback differs from negative feedback because it acts to accelerate change in the body. Now these are more rare because typically you don't want changes to be accelerated. Like you, don't, you wouldn't want an increase in body temperature to be accompanied by mechanisms that cause your body temperature to skyrocket. Okay? Um, but, they, but these positive feedback mechanisms make sense where they're used. So an example of positive feedback would be where um, during labor how when the uterus starts contracting, oxytocin is released, causes the uterus to contract more strongly, which causes more oxytocin to be released, which causes the uterus to contract even more strongly. And this will keep happening until birth. Okay? Another example of positive feedback in the body, you guys, is blood clotting. So a, a blood clot uh, is a positive feedback mechanism because once the blood clot forms in your bloodstream, the presence of that blood clot causes more blood clot to form. So you're accelerating or enhancing that change. By having the blood clot form, that can initiate more blood clots to form. So that's positive feedback. Now if blood clotting were like negative feedback, that would be like if you get a blood clot, but then all of a sudden your body breaks down that blood clot and the clot disappears because you're removing the change from the system. That's like negative feedback, but that doesn't happen usually, right? So um, that's an example of positive versus negative feedback mechanisms.